language, decision, and search. And then labs are an early look at emerging cognitive services, because we are adding new ones all the time to the platform. And so why would you use Microsoft Cognitive Services? Well, first, they're easy because they're just making an API call. So you just need a few lines of code to actually embed them into your application. They're flexible because you can integrate them into the language and platform of your choice. You're not needing to develop something new and custom in order to access them. And they're tested. We have lots of customers using these today, customers like Uber. Um, our own teams internally use them as well. And so diving a little bit deeper into the specific capabilities, uh, these are the categories laid out here. And so for vision, you can do things like object scene and activity detection, facial recognition, emotion detection. Um, example I like for this is that the NBA actually uses this API. So you can think of how many images are generated during a basketball game. And then someone was actually going through and manually tagging all of those. So instead of doing that, they just feed it to our vision API and it returns the tagged images, object detection, and things like that, and really speeds up the time and eliminates a lot of the error that would come from a human trying to do that. <laughs> the next is speech, so doing things like speech transcription, speech synthesis, and real-time speech translation. We also provide language detection, text sentiment analysis, key phrase extraction. Um, and then this category, decision, it wasn't there before. They have kind of, this is kind of a new category that we've seen emerge over the past couple of months. Um, so we have a content moderator, which can help if you have websites or anything where people can post <coughs> content and anyone can post. Maybe you want to have something to moderate that. We have a personalizer to help you really personalize experience in your app. So a recommendation engine to see what people are interested in. You can leverage something like the personalizer. And we have an anomaly detector which actually allows you to input any time series data and it'll detect, it'll understand the trends and it'll detect where the anomalies are within that data set. And then finally, there's the search. Um, so this is now called web search and this is all to do with anything that you can do in Bing, so image search, entity recognition, auto suggestion, that all falls into the search category. And so the first one that I'm gonna dive into is vision. And I'm quickly just going to jump over to a demo and show an example of that. Great. So this is the Azure Cognitive Services homepage. Um, like I said, this looks brand new today from what it did last week. And so here you see the categories that we just went over. And I'm going to click on Vision. And so there's a few examples here, but the one that I want to show first is computer vision. So this site, it actually just has a bunch of examples of how this could work. So in this example, there is just an image. I'll click on a different one. So you can see it's detecting the different objects. It's detected the man and the skateboard, and it's circled them and given the coordinates of where they are. It's also given a bunch of tags. So it's giving a tag name as well as a confidence level of all of them. You keep scrolling down, it also is going to generate description, um, image dimensions, and various other things. It will even generate um, an adult content flag. So if you're doing something like content moderation, if that's a concern, Let's see if this, okay, this went off for a second, but um, so anyways, if you can use that to flag whether or not that content needs to be moderated if that score was, a, was uh, very high. Another thing that you can do with computer vision is actually do handwritten text to text that's readable by a computer. So look, they have some cartoon images here, like this one, and it's actually able to pull the text out of that one. The one that I always like to show is this nutrition facts. So this image is taken, it's not even fully centered, it's a little bit angled, and it's kind of hard to see, but it was actually able to still pull all the information off of it. You can also do things like recognize brand celebrities and landmarks. We're a little biased in our examples. We have Saudi and Adela as two of the examples, our CEO 
Um, but you can click through here and you can test them out for yourself and it'll give the confidence score and return other, um, other features as well that very similar to the first photo that we saw. So this one has generated a caption saying Saudi and Adela wearing a suit and tie, for example. Another thing you can do through our Vision API is do things with face detection. Detect emotion, detect age, other things like that. So I'll show a quick example here. And actually, before I switch over to that, this is the Intelligent Kiosk. This is a desktop app that you can download yourselves and, play, and it features a lot of our cognitive services. All you need to do is provision a key in Azure and then you can come in and actually just test these out yourself and use them. So in the Vision API Explorer, I can go into here and I can take a photo of myself. I'll make uh, a neutral face. Or <laughs> maybe not there. <laughs> and it's gonna analyze. So it's generated a description, a woman smiling for the camera, um, so it's tagged, person, smile, clothing, human face, that's good that it's identified me as a human, it's nice to see. Um, <laughs> that's, an, that's a good one. It's estimated my age, which is fairly accurate. That one has gotten a lot better, I will say, over the past couple of years of uh, the age estimates, which is always difficult to do. Um, and so you can do things like that and, and actually detect a different emotion. The last thing I want to show in the vision category is custom vision. So I will go to the home page first. So what we've seen with the other ones so far is that you basically just make an API call. Like you have an image, you send it to the API, it returns the tags, it returns whatever information you want to take away from that. We also have one that's a little bit more custom. So it still makes it very easy for you to use, but you do you can actually provide your own images and train it on your own images. So for example, you can see here, we have a cu customers who want to classify different kinds of dents in an automobile. If you're trying to classify different kinds of structures and whether there's damage to them, that's another use case for something like custom vision. And so what I have here, I'm actually presenting this at a, at a conference this weekend. Um, so I figured I'd show it here first to test it out is we're looking at the hashtag she the north versus we the north and seeing um, what the brand is and, and learning more about the data behind that. But one of the examples we're doing is through custom vision. So I made a project where I've uploaded a bunch of images um, of different Raptors players. I did include Kawhi even though it's not there anymore. Um, and we've also looked at Bianca, um, the ten Canadian tennis player, and tried to train the model to identify some key players. So I've tried to, I, if, if you can see here on the side, I've added a few tags. So I have basketball, um, I have Bianca, Kawhi, Kyle Lowry, uh, Raptors, Siakam, Tennis, and Van Vliet. So basically I want to be able to identify the people that have been mentioned here, and I also want to see if they can identify, if this model can identify the sport that's being played. The other thing is you'll notice that there's this negative one. So that's just to train the model what's, if it doesn't fit into any of these categories, you can just throw random pictures in there to train that this is not anything that you're looking for. Um, and some ones that I haven't really tested out yet are, someone asked me if you could tell the difference between badminton and tennis, and no, it cannot do that yet. So I'd have to add some more images. Um, that's a difficult one because with the rackets, and you don't really know exactly what the model is looking for, but you can see the results of it. So basically all you do here is you add those images and then you add the tags. Once you've done that, I've already trained this, so I won't click it, but you just hit train. Then you'll be able to see some information um, here and some of the metrics. So uh, these are different metrics for model performance. It really depends what you're trying to optimize, but it's giving you these. It's also giving me some warnings down here because I have imbalanced uh, distribution of images per tag. So I have a lot of tags under basketball, but not that many under some of the other ones. So ideally, if I wanted this model to perform better, I should probably even those out a little bit. Um, but for now, this is still a working model that I'm just playing around with. And to show how this works, even without having an app, because to actually use this, you would need to call an endpoint and in embed this into an application. But without even doing that, I can actually test how the model's gonna do. So, 
I have a few images that I've saved. And first we'll try this one, because I'm pretty sure, I haven't tested these, I promise. But this one, I figured she would be able to get, because there's a lot of photos of Bianca wearing this outfit, because that was when she won the US Open title. Um, so it was actually hard to get the model to predict anything other than this outfit. But this one worked pretty well. It's almost 100% sure that it's tennis and Bianca, and it didn't flag any of the other ones, which is great. So I'll try one that's maybe a little bit more difficult. This is Bill Gates playing tennis. I think this was a charity match. Um, but this is still pretty good. It still was over 80% sure that it was playing tennis, and it knows that it's not Bianca, so that's great to see. And then if I give it something like, something that's totally irrelevant, that's another good thing to test. Oh, so it, it didn't think that this was anything that I, any of the takes that I've generated. So this is also showing that it's performing well. And then the last one I'll test out, because this one was, I was having trouble with this one before. Um, former Raptors player Mark Gasol, it still is kind of thinks it's Van Vliet. So it's not bad, it's below 50% now. Um, but it does show, although it's very simple to upload the training images, for very simple use cases, you might only need five or six images, because this is already a pre-trained model in the back end, and then you're just adding to it with your own custom images. However, you think about all the scenarios that you could encounter, and you do need a lot of images to actually make this start working effectively, like within the hundreds or thousands, which is still less than you would need if you were doing this completely from scratch. And once you are satisfied with the performance of your model and you think it's performing well, then you can hit publish. I have to have a resource uh, in Cognitive Services provisioned in Azure. And then I will get a prediction URL. And so now this is going to tell me how I can actually call this model. Um, it's giving me if I, you have an image URL or if you have an image file. And now if I have an application, I can just use this within my application. Um, and then I can start, uh, I can also track the model's performance over time to make sure it is actually, turn, uh, is, is actually turning back results that we would want to see. Okay, so I'm going to switch over quickly back to the presentation. So the next category is speech. And this is actually a paying example right now, but I think I have, I have my sound off, but essentially um, we can do speech recognition. And this is something that's very helpful for accessibility purposes to display the text in real time. Um, we also offer translation services. And so the speech services have been combined into this unified speech service, which provides kind of the text to speech and, and speech translation. They used to be all separate and they're all kind of merged into one now. And one example that I saw actually just yesterday in an Ignite uh, talk was that Spotify is actually using our speech services to help people develop their podcasts. So when they record the audio, then they can, it's actually using the speech to text, and then they can go in and they're editing the audio because that was a really difficult process before, really time consuming, and they can actually edit the text, which will in effect then edit the audio so they can publish their podcast faster. And then they can publish directly to Spotify. So it's really helping people to develop their podcasts a little bit faster. You can also do things like speaker recognition, and this basically involves three steps. You can enroll them, um, so you have to create a unique voice print for an individual. Then uh, you have to re uh, recognition after enrolling one or more of the, voice, the voices, you have to train it and say this is who's talking, very similar to in the custom vision. You have to tell the model who's actually speaking. And then finally, verification. So you could confirm if the voice belongs to a previously enrolled profile. And again, we kind of already touched on translator speech. Um, and I can share these slides out after, but just some more details on how that would actually work. So moving on to language. A few key capabilities here are text analytics. So when you're trying to detect sentiment, a common one that I've done before is pulling data from Twitter, taking the tweets in, extracting the key phrases, and then running a sentiment analysis over that. Uh, something like a Q&A maker is a very popular use case as well. If you have a knowledge base of data, you can, e you can create that within Q&A maker. Within five minutes, 
you can have something where people can query all of the all of your knowledge base and get an answer back. And then again, we have translator text within that and also language understanding. And language understanding is often used with our bot service. So I said we wouldn't really get into bots too much today, but essentially, if you're talking to a chat bot, you need it to understand natural language. You need it to understand the intent, different entities people are referring to and things like that. It can't just be a program back and forth, otherwise that's not gonna work very well. So with language understanding, you can actually train your own models to understand the intent of the users and improve it over time to give them an experience so that they're actually gonna get the answers that they need. The next category is decision. Like I said, this is a newer category. And so content moderator falls in that right now to decide whether or not something needs to be flagged for content moderation. The personalizer, which is in preview, to really help you deliver the right experiences in your application. So uh, if you're trying to re recommend a certain product, figuring out what people like and their interests to recommend the right thing. And then the anomaly detector, to find anomalies in your time series data. And this one, I will show a quick demo of. It seems um, this use case is very common that you have a data set and you want to find anomalies. Um, and actually the process of doing that can be more complicated than it seems on the surface because you have to look for different trends first and you have to understand where the noise is in the data. And the anomaly detector can help facilitate that. So for example, Let's use a manufacturing one. So basically what this is doing, it's putting in some streaming data, it's historical data that's time series, and it's the temperature of coolant B2 at a manufacturing plant. And if I run this, this is the data that it's seen, these last peaks here, and then this is say new data that would be coming in. And you can see it, it's found, it understands the, the trends, this, I guess those are kind of the seasonal trends, but then it sees that the spike that went up all the way to the top line, that that is an anomaly. And so this really helps you to detect those more quickly without having to build custom code to do that. And then the last category that we'll talk about before showing uh, another demo is search. And again, this is now apparently called web search as of from what I can tell yesterday. And so this encompasses a bunch of, as I mentioned before, a bunch of um, the search capabilities through Bing. So Bing search, um, image search, entities auto suggestion, um, and things like spell check. And this is really useful because if you think about you're creating an application and you users are used to having a really seamless search experience. And building that logic is non-trivial. So Instead of spending your time trying to build out the search logic, you can leverage one of these services and put that into your application and focus on the core, lo core logic of the application. And so with things like Big, Bing Web Search, you can narrow your results by market, uh, result type, search category, and more. So again, these kinds of things look like they'd be pretty simple because we're so used to seeing these, but they're really helpful when you're starting from scratch trying to build out your own applications with these, this kind of functionality especially things like Bing auto-suggest where somebody starts typing and we're used to having that auto-suggestion come down now. So having a service that can do that automatically for you is definitely an advantage. And so now for the last demo, before we go over to uh, a q and is the JFK files. And so to give some context on what this is, a few years ago, the US government released a bunch of documentation relating to the JFK assassination. And so some of the engineers at Microsoft thought, well, I want to actually, let's apply some of our technology and figure out, if we, see if we can create anything based on this data. Like this was a mix of, of handwritten text, of printed text, of images, all sorts of things. And so how do we actually understand all of that documentation? And so this is actually a public facing website um, again, I can share resources afterwards, but if you just go to jfk-demo.azurewebsites.net, you can try this out for yourself. Uh, and so I'll come to this home page here, and then I have to search for something. So I'm going to search Oswald. Harvey Lee Oswald, is, or Lee Harvey Oswald, is the man who was accused of killing JFK. And so now I see all the documents in the corpus that 
have his name in it. And I can click into this a little bit further. So, for example, this one. This is a handwritten document, and I don't know about you, but I can't read that. But apparently, uh, we were able to pull that, that off with our, um, with our cognitive services, making that a searchable text instead of this messy handwritten note. And so the other thing to point out is, the other thing, it, rec it knows that this is Oswald. It's the picture of him, and it's identified him as that, that is Lee Harvey Oswald. And then another thing I like to point out is this here. It says GP floor. And you might think this is a mistake. Like this, okay, they messed up somewhere using our cognitive services. But actually, GP floor was the CIA cryptonym for Lee Harvey Oswald post-assassination. And so they, there was a list of CIA cryptonyms that they used. And what our engineering team did was they actually went out and they built kind of a custom skill and integrated it into this architecture. So you can customize your cognitive services, and this is an example of doing that where they taught the cognitive service that actually GP floor refers to Lee Harvey Oswald. So you can pick up on things like that. The other cool part of this demo is that you can actually see a graph of all the connection, people that he was connected to or all the key phrases that he was connected to. And so if you want to continue to search, um, you can click on any of the related items and then it will search for both where it finds documents containing both of those people's names or both of those the names of those entities. And so this makes it a lot easier to kind of search through documentation rather than trying to read through all sorts of different PDFs and, and handwritten text. You can also see the architecture of how this was done here. Um, again, since we're mostly focusing on cognitive services, I, I won't get too far into this. Um, but basically, I also do want to just point out, if you look into this further, the reason they're using these icons is because they found them in uh, a PowerPoint slide. And it was referring to SQL database. And they, they, so they were kind of making fun of all the icons they used to use. Um, but this shows how you can use at the Azure all of the Azure platform to kind of build these kinds of uh, end results instead of just using just the one API call. This is how you would use it in an actual use case. The last thing I want to just show quickly is some of our cognitive services labs that are coming out. Um, so I think Project Ink Analysis is actually in preview right now. So being able to understand digital ink and then translating that into a more readable text format. Um, there are things like Project Gesture to incorporate gesture-based controls into your applications. And again, these are you can kind of look at these just to get an idea of what's on the roadmap for our cognitive services because they're always evolving. Um, another one that I didn't really point out today, but I think it is really useful to point out, is the form recognizer. So we have a new cognitive service that you can actually, it can read table, uh, data off a table on a form. And that's a very common use case, like having manual entry of invoices that are coming in and then entering them in Excel. Very time consuming, very error prone. Um, and they also announced that Ignite now in a, have something called the feedback loop. So there was a lot of issues with these. this service when it first came out. It couldn't always identify the right <coughs> pairs if there was complex tables. But now you can actually, have, there's a feedback loop integrated to say, you didn't identify this correctly, and you can actually help to train the model and make it work for whatever documents you have. Um, it also works for receipts as well. And just to finish off, I want to give a couple of use cases um, from our customers. So Uber actually uses our Face API to verify and validate the drivers are who they say they are. So every now and again, when they're driving, they have to look into their phone, it'll take an image, and they have to verify the identity of the driver to make sure that passengers are safe and that there aren't random people driving their passengers around. Um, another really awesome use case is something called the Seeing AI Project. So the guy in the picture here, he's actually an engineer at Microsoft, and he's blind. And so they've created an application that really helps him. It integrates a bunch of our cognitive services to help him kind of navigate the world. So for example, he talks that there's a video that you can go watch once I share these out. And he talks about when he's presenting to people, he can't tell if people are asleep or 
if or what's going on. So it actually will it looks out into the crowd and it'll give them some feedback on what's going on, which is is very helpful. Um, another cool thing that in that video that you can see is he's at a restaurant and he wants to look at the menu, and so he takes a picture of it with his phone with the application, and it actually guides him. So it'll say it tells your phone a bit to the right to make sure that it's more centered and can get, uh, read the text off uh, more effectively. And so to get started, um, you can go to azure.com slash cognitive or aka.ms slash cognitive, I believe. And there's tons of documentation on cognitive services as well as the rest of our platform. And so that was kind of a really quick overview. But again, I can share out these resources and this slide deck. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now or you can reach out to me later. To be honest, I've, I'm not sure why they unified it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. All right, it's a fun question. Um, how do you guys deal with, or rather, how do you provision the models over time when people come up with a faster ways to pull the networks through adversarial attacks? For example, if, um, if your computer vision model is running on a uh, Raspberry Pi that is the fourth, actually, whatever, uh, looking at the um, I don't know, site or garage, and somebody comes in with a uh, printed uh, picture that makes uh, it recognize as a turtle, but it's actually a person stealing your stuff. Yeah, and so. How do you provision that, and who's also uh, liable for, um, you know, the potential losses? So how do you provision? Yeah, so like, how do you, do you evolve the models? The models sort definitely of? evolve, and so in Europe, so first off, the example you gave for holding up an image, that won't work. It's actually looking at the depth of your face as well, so it's a little bit more complex than just holding up an image. I have heard of someone who has a twin, and their twin can log in using like Windows Hello, so he's also using our cognitive services, so that could be an issue. But the models are constantly being updated, yes, for sure. So our engineering team is constantly working on them and improving them over time. But it's not really about the face, right? Because yeah. um, the way they fool the networks is the fool from the whole image, right, sometimes. Um, or like, at least an example from Hong Kong or uh, even Russia, where people wear glasses that make basically fool the network uh, very easily. Like I still have my face open, not, not obstructed. I can see where I'm going, what I'm doing, but I'm wearing uh, uh, an adversarial patch on my, I don't know, like the forehead or like on my glasses. Okay, uh, I I don't know what the performance is like that, but I like they are improving them all the time over cases like that. I haven't heard of of the issue come up yet, but it likely will in the future. Um, but they are, so the models are constantly be working by our engineering team. You can't see them because you're just making the API call, right? So if you do need something custom built and you're super reliant on that, then I would advise kind of using a custom machine learning model if you can't, uh, if it's not giving you the result that you need. I find the key issues that I've seen at first is just kind of getting used to the fact that you can't see what's going on behind the scenes. And so whether or not, you think about, uh, in general, you want to be able to know that's why we made that decision. However, if you think about some of the use cases of these, it's doing text analytics. Do you need to know why this output a certain value? Um, so it's kind of the trade-off between not having to do a bunch of custom work and also making sure that you kind of know why certain decisions were made. And so that is, that is a common thing that comes up with some customers. Um, but I find actually integrating them into existing things, once they're kind of passed, it's more as a business, that's, that's kind of the, thing that, the hurdle that you have to get over. Because once you're actually integrating them, it's, it's usually relatively straightforward. Any other questions? So we have achieved 
uh, different human parity levels in things like speech to text, um, and they're being updated all the time. And so I think I heard some, someone, one of my colleagues said before, any given day there might be a different model that's better, but we're all kind of trying to outcompete each other. Where I think our differentiation is, is kind of having this into the entire ecosystem that we offer and having this, if you have cognitive services, you can easily work with our other data services and, and use our analytics services. And so it's kind of the entire platform that, that's our real advantage um, versus kind of comparing one-to-one -one technology. We are perceived to be behind in machine learning, um, which isn't true. I think it's, my personal opinion is I think it's kind of attributed to the fact that we don't really have a consumer product, like we don't have an assistant. Um, but it is definitely, we've achieved different, I'm not, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but we've achieved different human parity levels and, and are constantly improving. <laughs> yes? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I haven't been out here that long. I will say that the Q&A one comes up a lot. Um, kind of doing knowledge mining comes up a lot. And custom vision as well. I've seen more text analytics in Toronto than I have out here. But again, maybe I'll see that over more time. I believe it. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure if all of them are supported, but definitely some of them can be run on the edge. Yes. You mentioned you don't have a device in your plans for one to allow you to deploy these apps. Like like an assistant. I mean, we have Cortana, but there's no. I guess she's. It's kind of just works on Windows devices, to my knowledge. Um, we don't have anything coming out, but who knows? I don't work on the device side, so sometimes you're surprised by things that you see come out. So I would say ne never say never, but not that I know of. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could always do it custom, but when it's something that's already set up, um, it it's makes it seem a little bit easier. Um, but it, again, it, it, I would just go back to it ties into what else in the platform you want to be able to leverage. Anything else? All right, all right, thank you. Oh, one sorry, more. one last. Sorry, did you mention that you would be willing to share your slide deck. What medium are you willing to be publishing? Can we send out? We can do that. Uh, we can do that on our website or through Slack. Yeah, I don't. I'll oh, double check. I don't think anything in is in here is NDA. I can definitely show, show, uh, share out the resources for sure. Um, and I'll have to double check, but I think this this deck is good to share. Yeah, so we can put yeah, on the AI meetup group. You can group. go through it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. 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 Uh, so you said that some of the technology. I think a lot of it is customer feedback and starting to understand once you put these out and we're going around talking to customers about them, we can now give that feedback to our engineering team so they actually know what customers want. So one of those that I think is a big one is form recognizer, which wasn't one of the cognitive services. I think it came out in preview in June. Um, so it's relatively new, and that's something that is was very commonly being asked by. I have this table, yeah. and I want to extract data from it, and we didn't really have a way to do that before. Um, and so I think that was a perfect example of, of us f giving that feedback to the engineering team. Um, and that's how we kind of manage a lot of the things that we do, is we, we have mechanisms to give that feedback so that we can develop products that people actually want. Well, great. Thanks, All right, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, he already has the house.
Okay, we're off. We're just gonna have to run the